Hola friends, welcome to the Medicine, Marriage and Money YouTube channel, the only channel for physicians who want to achieve marital interdependence and financial freedom together. On this channel, you will learn how to show up as the best version of yourself so that you can love intentionally and build a more financially savvy relationship with your spouse. And I am your host, a physician mom, a doctor's wife, a Gottman leader, a certified life and marriage coach, Dr. Kate Mangona. Welcome, bienvenidos. I think for us, the the core part of it, and it's something that I don't think really existed for the first few years of our marriage, but it's a basic, like 100% each one commitment to the marriage. So we know that whether I have a stroke or, you know, fall over half dead, or she has a problem, we're going to, we're going to be there for each other and take care of everything. And when we do have an argument or a disagreement, um, you know, it's going to be resolved. We're not really great at, you know, just saying, well, we're not going to go to bed angry. I mean, we've been, we've gone to bed angry many times, but again, we, you know, we wake up the next morning. It's like, well, we got to make this work. We got to make up and figure this out because there's, this is it, yeah. you know, we're sticking it out to the end. Welcome to this next episode of the Medicine, Marriage, and Money podcast. Today, you guys are in for a special treat because I have a past former member of the pod of the Doctor Podcast Network. I used to belong to Doctor John Jerica. Doctor John Jerica is a board certified family physician who began doing non clinical side jobs early in his career. He and Dr. Tom, da Tom Davis run New Script, an online community for healthcare professionals, career transition mentors, and wellness specialists. John has been married for 22 and a half years, we'll find out if happily or not, and has a blended or blended family, including four daughters and one son from the ages of 30 to 36. So I'm so excited to see you because it's been a year or two since we were in the Doctor Podcast Network together and before it's sadly dissolved. Welcome, Dr. John Jerica. Hello. Thanks for having me, Kate. It's good to see you again. Yes. Yeah, so, so let's start off. Take me back 22 and a half years ago, or maybe even before that, because I know you did mention that you had gone through a divorce and starting over wasn't easy again. So what did that look like? How did you fall in love and how did you navigate this next chapter of your life? Well, as I, yes, as you mentioned, there was a first marriage um, and it was about 14, 15 years and it dissolved for a variety of reasons. And uh, I was single for several years. Um, I took great advantage of those years. I did a lot of traveling and so forth, but there was definitely a gap there, which is good. You need that gap. You don't want to jump into something, you know, suddenly. And uh, I was the chief medical officer at the hospital where I worked. And uh, A was a respiratory therapist. And uh, I remember just sort of feeling like, you know, I think it's time for me to look around and meet someone who would really fit with, you know, my background and my interests and so forth. And uh, I remember I was on one of the medical floors just looking around, probably wanted to talk to one of the physicians. And there was this respiratory therapist. It was Kay. Didn't know her name, didn't know who she was. And she kind of turned her head and looked at me out of the corner of her eye. And I looked at her and it's like, hmm, there's something interesting going on here. So that's how we met. And actually, I think that very day, as she walked from the medical floor into the ICU, I basically kind of tracked her down. I just ran down the hall and said, hey, I'm <laughs> Dr. Jerica. And you know, who are you? I haven't seen you here before. And we had a conversation, which is really weird because I'm a total introvert, as many physicians are, you know, introverts. And, uh, but I don't know, there was something. And so that's how it started. And, and what was it? What was it that like, 
captured you. Something is going on here is what you said. What, what was that? And then how did you fall in love? Like, did you know right then? Or was it something about those first few dates? Well, that's a bone of contention because uh, my wife constantly brings up the fact that she was the first one to say that she loved me. Mm -hmm. And it's true. I was, I, in spite of being sort of anxious to meet her and get to know her and even find out if she was single or whatever, I didn't see a ring on her finger. Um, no, I was definitely a lot more tentative and slow. You know, I, but what happened was we just decided, yeah, we're going to go out to dinner, got to know each other a little bit. That day, and honestly, from the first time we dated, we, neither of us saw anybody else. And I think it was a good two years before we were engaged, but uh, we just spent a lot of time together. Gradually, you know, when you're doing a second marriage, particularly where kids are involved, there's always like you have to be careful. You really don't want to involve your kids in a relationship or even meet the other person too early. It's just not worth the entanglements and the emotional attachments that can occur. And I think we both kind of knew that. But then after, you know, a year or so, it, it seemed like, well, I guess we're never going to be apart again. So we better move forward. Um, I don't know. We just really clicked. We had the same values as far as family. Um, I mean, we were really both sort of shattered when we were became, when we ended up getting divorced the first time. I mean, we, neither of us had imagined that that would happen, but for whatever a variety of reasons. And so we were both being kind of cautious. Um, but Kay was always a lot more forthcoming when it came to her feelings. In fact, I'm a total like like a blank slate, like you don't know what I'm thinking any given moment. I have a very straight face and uh, may have gotten better since I've gotten older, but she, everything she thinks of or feels is immediately obvious on her face. She cannot hide her emotions. So in that way, we're, I guess we're the opposites, but we're complementary. So she made it really clear that she really liked me. And uh, we just spent more and more time together, started integrating the kids. Um, but you know, we both kind of kept things separate, kept separate homes. We didn't move in together. We just said, okay, we're going to make a commitment. And we both really believe strongly in a commitment. So once we made a decision, became engaged, and about a year later, we ended up getting married at a local country club. Okay. And what would you, what would you wish if, some, if you could go back and talk to yourself, okay, at you, either during your first marriage or just like when you were starting over again? If you could go back now and talk to yourself, what is like the one piece of advice you would tell yourself? Oh, about relationships and marriage in general? Yes. Yeah. Um, to focus more on actually what is actually happening and to be to be a better communicator. I think with the first marriage, you know, we learn a lot from our mistakes, I guess, is probably the thing to learn. And um you know, I had just put a lot of things off. I, my ex and I really weren't that good communicators with each other. There were a lot of just expectations and they weren't vocalized and a lot of assumptions. And also, it's probably not the best idea to get married the first month of your medical uh, education in medical school. That was a big, you know, and it was all done out of expedience. We lived, we would have lived apart. So we kind of rushed getting married and, uh, you know, probably just overlooked a lot of things that we should have spent a little more time discussing and observing before getting married. So that's one thing I learned from that. Um, so, but we got through all that. Um, so it sounds like being in a rush is never helpful. No, no. And, uh -huh. and I was thinking about this based on, you know, coming here, you made me think <laughs> about, you know, what actually happened. And, and yeah, like, you know, I was doing things myself. I won't even blame my ex at all. It was sort of like, okay, I'm going to be away, uh, you know, from a financial standpoint, it's just too hard for us to be apart. We should probably get married so we can live together and we have less expenses. You know, it's not, that was not a, an emotional feeling. That was a expediency. And as I look back, it was just so stupid to think that way. But I, I think I was pretty immature at that point in spite of being like, 24 years old or older before I went to med school. Oh, yeah. Well, we all were, John. <laughs> we were all. Yeah, I know. I, I can see a lot of that these days, you know, always. <laughs> so tell me about med school. I know that you you were rejected initially your first few applications to med school. What tell me why you're why you're grateful for that? 
Well, I'm grateful because, okay, I went through the whole process. I applied to medical school. I stuck to really all the local state schools and um, I was rejected. And that kind of was, uh, uh, that made me a little unhappy. But the reason it was a good thing is it gave me a little time to mature. And so what I did was I had a degree in chemistry. So I became a food science at Kraft Foods that was in the Chicago area. And uh, as I was still living at home at the time. In fact, when I went to undergrad, I was commuting and working full time pretty much. But um, so now I had an opportunity. Okay, I'm going to work. I'm going to move out. I'm going to, and I had a couple of roommates. And so my two roommates were PhD food chemists at Kraft as well. And I would not want to have missed the opportunity to live with those two guys for about a year and a half. Okay. Um, and uh, just, we did so many things. I learned how to be independent. I had, they basically were both older mentors to me. I mean, they were in their thirties. They were PhDs. Like I said, had a lot of experience. Neither of them were married. Um, and we had fun doing things together. And uh, my one, the one roommate, even while we were still roommates, ended up getting sick and going to Mayo Clinic and dying, which was not an upper, you know, obviously. Yeah. But you learn a lot from that. He had Crohn's his whole life. And so he had many, many surgeries. And he was one of those few unfortunate people that I didn't understand at the time. But looking back, he developed uh, like a small cell, a small tumor, uh, colon, not colon, but small intestine tumor. So he was discovered jaundice with liver mats. That was his first sign. And, you know, it all related back to his chronic inflammatory bowel disease. So, uh, and the other thing we learned in that is my other roommate and I made arrangements to go see him in Mayo. And uh, before we could get on our flight, we found out he had already passed away. So, don't procrastinate out there, friends, when there are bad things happening around you. So, learned a lot of lessons with that and, and continued to live with the other roommate for a while until I did get accepted to medical school after that two-year break. And, uh, you know, they were good friends. And my other roommate, Kanye Yabamoto, was another lifelong friend from Japan. And he taught me how to cook Japanese food. And and we did, I just learned a lot from them as, as mentors and kind of big brothers that I never had. Ah, uh, so yes. Yeah, so you had a lot of experiences that opened up uh, an opportunity for experiences in your life. Yeah. It was, looking back, I really am thankful for that. And it was just, you know, it was nothing that I planned. How would you recommend for others who may be more closed off, introverted, or not just kind of skeptical of the world? I, I see this a lot. Um, a lot of my physician colleagues just seem to be pretty skeptical. What would you say to them about just being more open? How could they view the world as a little bit more open to just accepting whatever comes? I, I know you, you <laughs> talk about you know being open to accepting invitations that enrich your life. What does that look like? What does that mean? I guess what it means for me is that if somebody that I trust asks me to try something, I mean, I, I came to the point and it wasn't early on, but I guess really based part of my experiences before going to med school was that to say, I have a tendency to say yes. Um, and it's about not so much that I'm a risk taker, but that I think, you know, if somebody is in my life and they obviously care for me, they're not going to ask me or recommend I do something that's going to hurt me. So, I mean, I have agreed to some pretty weird things uh, over the years, but I have not really regretted any of it. So, I've learned from everything. Give us an example. What are some of these weird things? What's the weirdest things? Well, I was pretty good friends with um, one of the managers or directors at uh, the hospital where I worked. And she asked me one day if I would be willing to go to a two or three hour meeting on a weeknight up in Chicago, which is like an hour away from where I live. And it was going to teach me something about just looking at life and, um, and um, how to think differently. That was it. And it was like, you know, it was clearly like a come on to some kind of introductory meeting to some cult or something. But I said, <laughs> yeah. I said, fine. You know, if you ask me, I'm going to do it. That's why I did it. I, not because there was anything about her description. It was be, simply because she asked me to go. So I went and it was, it turned out to be what's currently the sort of grandchild of EST, which is their heart seminar training, which is a program called Landmark Forum, Okay. which if, you know, a lot of people have heard of it. And um, so I went through that. I went through, I went for years 
learning, how, you know, their approach to thinking and decision making and how to look at life. So, it was what is cool. that? I actually have never heard of it. So, what is what is Landmark Forum? Well, it's a it's a it's a program of education. It's actually a national company. It's been around for a long time because that was over thirty years ago, um, and. The, the the major program they do, the, the, the main, the, they call it the forum, is you get about 100 people in a room and you basically lock them in there together. Uh, you can leave for bathroom breaks and you can have a little snack, but pretty much you're in there for like three days in a row, eight to 10 hours a day. Okay. And the facilitator just, uh, just sort of walks you through a process of how to look at things differently. Mostly it's around how to understand that phys- that humans are meaning making machines and how most of the meaning that you ascribe to things in life are completely made up and arbitrary. Yeah. And so it, it does, it does a lot more to it, but it gives you a different way to look at things, you know, like let's say a simple example, if you, if someone cuts you off in traffic, your knee jerk reaction is to get pissed off and say that person's disrespecting me, that a-hole, blah, blah, blah. And when someone cuts me off in traffic, I just think, I bet they just came from their doctor and was told they have cancer or, I mean, they're all stories, but you can make up a positive story. You can make up a negative story. So the stories I usually make up are, there's a good reason why the person did that. It has nothing to do with me or dislike of me or they think I'm stupid. So yeah, it goes on from there, but it was, it was very useful for me over the years because it helps as a physician to remain calm. Yes. You don't assign meaning to a lot of things that happen around you. This sounds like like a Tony Robbins or like a life coach school. I mean, this is, this it is. is up my alley, John. <laughs> yeah, it's up your alley. Yeah, you should just look up the forum, the Landmark Forum, and read about it. It's I still have the papers, you know, in my files. I go through them occasionally to get ideas for things. But, but yeah, it's 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 there. It's been around a long time, and the, you can tell when someone's gone through it because they speak in a certain way. I've seen different speakers like Tony Robbins. I don't know that he went through it, but I mean, you can tell the vernacular that they use that, oh, there's a forum graduate, I think. Yeah. Different ways of thinking. Okay. No, I love it. That That's, that's uh, def- I would not classify that as a cult, but I can see how many <laughs> yeah. people would for sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> I tried to get people to go with me. I'd say, Hey, you want to go with me? And they would hear, listen, and they go, I'm not going to that. That sounds pretty sketchy. <laughs> I'll go. I'll go. Okay, now let's let's back up a little bit and talk about these nine other siblings and what it is like to be the eldest of 10 children. Were you the favorite? Were you the pet of the family? Or what was that like? Yeah, I guess in some ways, I, it's in a, you know, it's the, f- the first child syndrome, you know, it's almost impossible for that child not to get the most attention uh, from a very, you know, attentive parent who quickly became not attentive by the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth kid. Uh, by the time there were 10, we were pretty much all on our own. So that, that taught me a lot of independence, but, um, but what was it like? Uh, it was, I, I was pretty pushy. I, I would, I would push my younger siblings around. I usually got my way. So at the time, you know, we had a television set with a turn knob on it and, and I would turn it. And if anyone touched it, boy, I'd push my weight around, but we, you know, it's, I don't know if it's true of all large families, but we all get along very well. We're still all, most of us in the Midwest, we still see each other quite frequently. And we don't have any internal squabbles at this point. So, okay. Okay. uh, Let's just talk about this. You have nine siblings. Nine siblings. You all get along. Okay. Mm -hmm. What? How did your parents create that? You know, that's a good question. My parents were devoted to the family in the sense that. I mean, they were two very different people. I mean, my my mother was a devout Catholic and my father was an atheist. My, my dad didn't graduate from high school. He had a couple of years of high school education. My mom, you know, made it through high school. She came a very, you know, sort of well-to-do family. My dad came from a really not well-to-do family. It kind of was stuck in the depression. But um, the thing about both of them was, uh, for my mom, it was really her faith and the family. And my dad was always a family. And so he would work two or three jobs. And, you know, there were times really where I didn't see him for weeks at a time. But we always knew that they were both very devoted and were looking at each of us, you know, out for each of us and loved us all. That was just the feeling that we got. And believe me, my some of my siblings and I are really different. And we don't necessarily like, we don't see eye to eye on things, but we all 
get get along. In fact, it was just this. I think might be interesting, you know, because I was going to maybe bring up the issue of the parents as they're you know getting older. But both of my parents died within about a year and a half of each other. They were in their eighties, and all ten of us were at both of their deaths at home. Uh, we had the help of hospice, but honestly, we didn't really need hospice because there was always somebody with them. Okay. And I think that was just like the culmination of, you know, them spending their lives just kind of devoting themselves to their family. Uh, okay. Yes. How did you prepare for that? I mean, how did you, and when I say that, I mean, their death, because I know you, you know, you've talked about how everybody needs to prepare for their parents' death at some point. That's essential. Why is it essential? Because there's a lot of decisions that have to be made. There's a lot of crap going on when someone's dying that if you don't think about it up front, it's going to be very, and you see this all the time. I, my wife runs a home helpers, which is in-home caregivers for the elderly. And basically all of her clients eventually die. And there's so much dysfunction. And I've seen that. And we've seen it as physicians too, with, with patients that were not really themselves prepared to die when they have a terminal illness, but their parents, they don't always, there's a lot of dysfunction, you know, when you're dealing with children of parents who are in the ICU or in a nursing home or on hospice that are basically dying. So for me, as I saw my parents getting older, I would do things to prepare for them. I would imagine them dead basically is what I would do. I mean, I'm not, it sounds kind of weird, but it's sort of like I started doing it with my pets <laughs> because, you know, pets, they only last 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And, you know, I've had not many, many pets. And so I know that all my pets die. My pets get annoying sometimes and they irritate me. And so what I used to do is, you know, yell at them or, you know, just ignore them. But now what I started doing about 10 years ago was, okay, the reality is when this, pet, when this pet is gone, I'm going to miss them. And so every time I get angry at my pet, instead of, instead of like being bad to them, I actually pick them up and give them attention and say, I appreciate the fact that you're still here and I'm going to miss you when you're gone. And so I kind of did the same thing with my parents because I knew as they started getting older, it, I didn't know when it was going to happen, but I knew they were going to be gone. And actually, I mean, some of my siblings, I think, never imagined our parents would be gone because they were really shattered when our parents died, um, you know, which is fine. I love them, but I don't, it's not helpful, <laughs> you know, and if you're the one, if you're only, have, if you're the only child or you're one of two or three, somebody has to be in charge because there's so much that has to happen, you know, just taking care of them and seeing that they're cared for, that they're not in pain, going to the doctor's visits, make sure they get their meds. I mean, these things just pile up. And I mean, again, having nine siblings, it made it a whole lot easier on me. One of my siblings is a nurse. So, I mean, that helps. So, plan ahead, maybe have nine siblings. But if you can't do that, you know, be proactive and, and think about these things. And, you know, and you talk about money too, you know, this whole thing about like having a will. And I mean, some people don't have a will. If they have a will, nobody knows what's in the will, which is stupid. Like, come on, communicate. And as long as you have someone like me you or you that? that can take some charge, it helps. Okay. So did you help prepare your parents? To, for, to, did they have a, uh, you know, a will or did they not? Or were you a part of that? I actually wasn't a part of it. They, they had it. We, I don't know if it was one of my other siblings that made sure they had it or they okay. just did it on their own, but it became clear, especially my mother got ill first. And so I think that really made my father think, okay, I really have to, because he always thought he was going to go first. He had about a 200 pack year history of smoking. And he was in miserable shape, but for whatever reason, he outlived my mom. And so he, he, when he saw my mom getting ill, he kind of made sure that he had seen an attorney and had all that done. Now, he didn't really discuss that. I mean, part two is you should really discuss it with your kids and let them know, you know, what's in there. I mean, it didn't really matter in our family because my parents didn't have any money or any belongings. To I mean, you know, she, they had like a small townhouse. But, uh, you know, you can imagine if there's a lot of finances involved, then it, it, it gets very weird. Like with my my wife, uh, she has three siblings. And when her mother died, her father had died when she was much younger. But when her mother died, two of the siblings sued the other two. Um, her two of her sisters who, you know, really weren't that involved. And in, actually, the other, my wife and her older sister were the executors. And I don't know why someone would uh, assign two, but for whatever reason, they did. And it turned out that the two didn't know what was in it because the mom never told anybody. 
there wasn't much. It was just, again, a house that got split four ways when it was sold. But the other two just felt like there was a lot of, like, they didn't know what was going on because the, the mom had never shared it. So um, there's a lot of things to think about. And there's even, there's another step even beyond that, which is even scarier, which is when we die. Because, you know, at that point, it's our children that have to take care of us. Yes. Or have to see that we're cared for. And that's, nobody thinks about that in a way. I don't, I never hear anybody who's in their 60s and 70s in my age talking about, well, what's going to happen when I'm 85? Because that's a big deal too. Yeah. Oh, yes. We have a a trust, a revocable, an irrevocable trust. Um, we created actually before we even had children. So I think we probably need to update that. That's pretty good. <laughs> So, okay, prepare for your parents' death is essential. Let's talk, I want to talk a little bit about how you came across the non-clinical careers, the non-clinical side jobs, a little bit about that, and then wrap up with some, how you split finances in your house. Oh, okay. Okay. The quick answer to how I got into non-clinical careers is I started doing them. I started doing them myself, let's say physician advisor for utilization management at a hospital, mainly because I was looking for moonlighting. Okay, make a little money. My partners didn't care. And then, oh, well, I, I got, you know, con convinced to become a medical director for some service line in our hospital and for a family planning clinic because nobody else would do it. Okay, that was fun. But I actually enjoyed it. Enjoyed learning the, uh, learning the management side. And so once burnout started really kicking in heavy for me, I, uh, you know, I said, well, why don't I transition completely? So I became the VP for medical affairs and then the chief medical officer for a hospital. I did that for 14 years. And the last four, I didn't see patients at all. So I'd kind of written off patient care. And then somebody randomly contacted me about becoming a partner in an urgent care center. So I said, okay, I'm going to quit the hospital. I'm going to become a partner and do go back to clinical. And during that inter that time, you know, I really just became interested in uh, addressing burnout and just this, you know, this lack of fulfillment, dissatisfaction, and you know the way medicine's being practiced. And so I started blogging, and then I thought, well, I want to learn more about this. So that's when I started the podcast. I actually started the podcast in part just because it was interesting and new. And also because it was the way I was going to figure out about how these non-clinical careers work by interviewing a bunch of people that have done different non-traditional types of careers, either during, partially, or after their clinical work. So that's what I did. And I just started you know, really getting into that. Now it's become kind of a mission of mine. It's sort of like, you know, why are so many physicians miserable? The solution isn't always to leave medicine, but it's a solution for some people. So now I, I try to do things to basically inspire, encourage, and teach physicians how to do something different, but with the proviso that they build it on their clinical background. Because, I mean, you can do other things, that's fine. But to me, it's what, what physicians don't realize is those all those jobs, those positions, whether it's a business or working for someone else, all those things are actually the next step in their career. You just can't think about that when you're going to med school. So right. these people, most of them do even better when they move on to a non-clinical career. They usually get paid more and they have a bigger impact on patients and you know people in pharma and hospital management. So that's why it interests me. And now I've pretty much devoted my free time to doing that. Yes, no, absolutely. And and you have a summit coming up too, right? What's that called? Yes. So another physician and I, Tom Davis, who is pretty well known for telemedicine and working remotely in that, he and I, I don't know, he, we just somehow uh, decided we wanted to do something together. So we started a community called New Script. And actually, we had a different name, and then we we went through a whole branding thing. We changed the name to New Script, writing a new script of your career. Um, but it's all around that. But it's more it's expansive in the sense it's for other clinicians as well. It's for APNs and PAs and uh, you know, anyone you can think of who's a licensed clinician. Really, again, achieving the same things. You know, finding a job or a career or a side gig that brings you some joy and satisfaction. And so we started a community. It's like an app. It's sort of a Facebook lookalike, but it's all private. There's no advertising except whatever things we might be promoting inside of it. And we actually recruit people to be mentors, you know, if they have an expertise. So we thought, well, what's the next step in trying to share what we know? We, we made it free for about the first 
nine months. And now there's a little monthly membership for that. But we thought, let's do a summit. Let's take some of our mentors and other experts and get them all together on a Zoom call. And we'll do you know, three days, four lectures a day, and we'll make it free to everybody. So we created that. Uh, this is going to be interesting because we haven't done this before. So that's what the plan is for April. We're doing that. It's in the evening. We decided we want it to be live. So really we could have a good Q&A for, for each speaker. So it's 30 minutes of a lecture and then a 20 minute of Q&A and then the next person. It's in the evenings actually during the week of the 11th to the 13th of April because we did surveys and the survey said they wanted it during the week and didn't want to have to waste their weekend. So waste, I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> take their weekend up. Oh, okay. Wait. Physicians, you know, physicians are cheap and they're very they cognizant of their time. So, okay. <laughs> so that's what we're doing. We're, you know, the whole thing is free, but there is a, there is a, of course, a paid version for the really just the recordings, the video okay. and audio and some bonuses, but anybody can attend it for, for free. So right. yeah. And I saw some great speakers there too. When you, when you first um, sent me that email, all the speakers, I, I know most of those people, they're like my yeah. friends. They do great work. So I'm excited for this new script summit, April 11th through 13th in the evening. So you can still do <laughs> your day job. Um, let's just close it out with how do you, uh, how do you split your finances in your house? Okay. But before I do that, I have to give you the link for the summit. Oh, yes. Link. <laughs> so Link. it's nonclinicalphysicians.com, which is my website, nonclinicalphysicians.com forward slash summit 2023. Okay. It, the landing page doesn't actually exist now, but by the time this comes out, there will be a landing page that will explain more about that if they want to, you know, take part of that. So, so nonclinicalphysicians.com forward slash summit. 2023, S U M M I T 2023, summit 2023. Okay, perfect. I'll put that in the show notes. Okay, good. Oh, splitting finances, huh? Is that what you said? Split? Well, like, do you charge the finances? Is your wife in charge? Do you guys both do it? Are you guys overspenders, underspenders? You guys yell at each other for spending too much money. What does it look like? Okay, now these are just all secrets. Um, <laughs> no, we we are overspenders. We're not the best planners. I've never uh, followed a budget in my life. M my wife has never heard the word budget, I don't think. But <laughs> um, she does her part because she runs her own business. And there have been times before the pandemic where that was a very lucrative business. So, I mean, I can't criticize her for what she does. And not to mention raising the kids uh, until they left home. Um I do. I'm the one interested, you know, I mean, I, I go so far as I am in part of an investment club, you know, I go monthly for an investment club and I keep track of all that and I keep track of all of our accounts and either of us can pay the bills. She did it for a few years, but I took it over when I started to be kind of semi-retired. So I'm paying all the bills and, um, and, and so she just contributes by, you know, uh, doing things here at, uh, physically at the house and running her business and supporting what I do. And I support her any way I can. So basically what I'm hearing is you guys just try to figure out how to make more money. You try to figure out how to make a lot of money so that you don't have to worry about creating a budget. <laughs> well, that's sort of one way. Although we were good, we weren't over the top savers like, you know, some people you've talked to. Uh -huh. I, you know, I definitely put 15% away year after year after year going back 30 some years. So yeah, it's, I mean, we do have a nest egg from that standpoint. But yeah, we don't have, you know, a bunch of passive incomes or, you know, we don't have to have someone do our daily uh bill paying, that kind of thing. But I do most of it and I have time to do it. It's pretty simple. Okay. And what overall makes your marriage successful? And I often like to call this um, the definition of marital interdependence. Okay. You know, I sometimes, I, I, I tend to ask all my guests, what is your definition of marital interdependence? Hmm. Well, this week's episode is sponsored by our Making Marriage Work program for couples. Making Marriage Work is an eight-week online program focused on helping physicians and their spouses feel less stuck and disconnected and more in love and passionately grateful, which prevents years of pent-up resentment and allows marital interdependence and emotional freedom to start now. We will help you tap into those hidden butterflies faster together. 
The course is only open a few times a year, so be sure to get on our wait list at medicinemarriageandmoney.com. I think for us, the, the core part of it, and it's something that I don't think really existed for the first few years of our marriage, but it's a basic, like 100% each one commitment to the marriage. So we know that whether I have a stroke or, you know, fall over half dead, or she has a problem, we're going to we're going to be there for each other and take care of everything. And when we do have an argument or a disagreement, um, you know, it's going to be resolved. We're not really great at, you know, just saying, well, we're not going to go to bed angry. I mean, we've been, we've gone to bed angry many times, but again, we, you know, we wake up the next morning. It's like, well, we got to make this work. We got to make up and figure this out because there's, this is it. Yeah. You know, we're sticking it out to the end. Yeah. Okay, sticking it out to the end. It's okay to go to sleep angry as long as the next day you wake up and you ask, how are we going to work this out? Yeah. I don't tell my clients that they can't go to sleep angry, (laughs) John Tarika, so that's okay. Okay, good, because you know a lot of people say that. It's like, uh, no. Not something I say as a marriage coach. Okay, good. (laughs) Is there anything else (laughs) as it pertains to medicine, marriage, or money? that you would just like to impart as your lasting words of wisdom unto our audience today? Mm. Well, it helps if you're an optimist. (laughs) So if you're a pessimist, you need to become an optimist in a way. But I think, you know, like for me, that's what keeps me going. I can't necessarily tell you what is, would be the advice from Kay. um, But Again, it gets back to even doing the form and that's the way you look at things, the way you couch things, the way you interpret things is that, you know, things can always be worse. And I tend to always look, you know, the glass half full. I mean, there's so many good things going on. So let's maybe uh, acknowledge the good things and focus on the good things and, you know, try to have more of the good things. And let's let the stuff that was maybe not so good just go away. Okay. Yes. Optimism. And say goodbye to things that just don't serve you. I love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on to my show today and telling everybody where to find you and just sharing all those really amazing relationship, family tidbits. Thank you so much, Dr. Jerika. It's been my pleasure. It's nice seeing you again, Kate. Thanks a lot. Episode with Dr. John Jerika. So many good take-home points. Where can I start? Number one, being in a rush is not helpful. The expediency of life and situations is often not helpful in our relationships. This can cause us more pain and less gain. Think about getting children ready for bed. The more in the rush you are getting out the door for school, the less they want to comply. Same thing with getting married. If you're in a rush, why? Are you afraid of losing your spouse to somebody else? Are you, is there some, what's what's the fear? Remember, love is patient. Unvocalized expectations are extremely harmful and can often end in divorce. Relationship destruction. When we have expectations that we don't vocalize, our spouse never even knows about them. Sometimes when we do vocalize them, our spouse still does not live up to them because expectations in general, I feel, uh, if they're unreasonable and most, (laughs) a lot of expectations are unreasonable because we have so many of them. Uh, Well, they don't get vocalized. And then when they do get vocalized, there's just too many. That's called the manual. Okay. If you want to know more, more about the manual, visit my Facebook group, Medicine, Marriage, and Money unvocalized expectations will never get met. Number three, say yes to weird things. Let's go to a meeting about how to think differently. Yeah, well, think differently. Change your thoughts, change your life. Okay, (laughs) Dr. John Jerika didn't know this because he doesn't know me that well, but like that is exactly 
what I preach. That's why I went to the Life Coach School. The Life Coach School teaches about choosing thoughts that are more helpful. Okay. And that's what I coach on is choosing those thoughts. Not that I want you to get rid of those thoughts that are unhelpful, but just notice them. Right. We have 60,000 thoughts a day as a human being. Which one of those thoughts are you ruminating about? Why aren't you ruminating about a more happier, more joyful, or a thought that you'd rather be in? Now, if you know if you're experiencing the depth of a loved one, you're grieving, that wouldn't be appropriate. If it was like that same day or the next day or a week or even a month later, and sometimes several months, some, some of us take several, several months and years to process grief. However, you get to decide when you want to hold on to a thought you don't like and a thought you do like. I hope you like walk away asking yourself, am I vocalizing my expectations are my expectations reasonable? How can I drop some of my expectations? Am I in a rush? How can I be less in a rush? Can I imagine my parents dead? As morbid as that sounds, would this be helpful? How could this be helpful? Being aware of my parents' impending or pending mortality might be helpful in accelerating getting documents together, talking about a revocable or revocable trust, and leaving you on a maybe a slightly more positive note. Note how can I? Encourage my friends and interfaith marriages that even if they're having trouble, right? Interfaith marriages can work. They can. If you have the same core beliefs in different religions, they can work. So much love, my friends. I hope you fly away spreading kindness, love, and patience everywhere you go. If you are finding the concepts I teach in these episodes useful and want more in-depth and personalized support for your relationship, consider this your invitation to join me in creating the most connected and intimate relationship with your spouse that you could dream of. Go to www.medicinemarriageandmoney.com right now and download my 18-page Medical Marriage Survival Guide and Workbook at no cost to you. I also have a six-day marriage challenge, which goes over the six predictors of divorce at no cost to you. These have been known to decrease fighting, rumination, and grudges between you and your loved one. If you want to take it a step farther, really enhance the joy and connection in the most intimate relationship in your life, sign up for my eight-week Making Marriage Work program today at medicinemarriageandmoney.com. Thanks for leaving us a stellar review, subscribing, and sharing with your friends on social media. You have the power to improve someone else's life and marriage simply by sharing this episode. Much love to you and your spouse. You're exactly where you need to be in this moment. Adios, my friends. The content of this episode is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical or financial advice. The opinions provided on this episode are for are those of myself or the invited guest alone. They do not represent the opinions of any particular institution Always seek the advice of your physician or financial advisor with any questions you may have of a medical condition or financial plan. This is for your entertainment only.